You do too. So, and with that, we uh, will begin our last panel and uh, welcome our, our two guests. Uh, and uh, I would ask that if they would introduce themselves. And uh, when we uh, when we get that done, then we're going to give some time for some opening remarks. Uh, would you uh, take time to introduce yourselves and tell us who you represent? Yes, it's part of my. Uh, okay, paper well, there. So, yeah. well, uh, from up here, I can see your name is J Chief Terence Paul. So we'll get we'll get to you now in a moment. Okay. And okay, I'll introduce you, then. Bruce Wildsmith and Terence Paul. And my understanding is that the uh, Chief Paul has some opening remarks. Yes. And uh, certainly we welcome you and take thank you for taking the time to join us here this evening and for coming in a few minutes early because uh, we did uh, uh, plan to start a little bit later. But we certainly thank uh, thank you for taking the time and certainly we have some opening remarks, Chief Paul, and then we'll have some questions from our senators. The floor okay. is yours. All right, thank you. Well, first of all, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, fellow witnesses and guests. Thank you for having us here to discuss the implications of Bill six, C-68 on our fisheries. I am here representing the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. As a co-chair of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, portfolio lead on fisheries, and as chief of my own community, member two, I would like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation on whose traditional and unceded territory in which we gather today and who have been living on these lands since time immemorial. Although you may already know, the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs consists of the chiefs from all 13 Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia. Together, we work with delegated authority to oversee any issues that are common to all of our communities, and today's issue is a very good example of that. What brings us to the Senate Committee today is our concern with Bill C-68. Firstly, this bill has a serious flaw in its definition of indigenous fisheries. As defined in this bill, the concept of indig indigenous fisheries is limited to those who fish for food, social, ceremonial, and subsistence purposes only. With this, with this definition, Mr. Chair, Bill C-68 continues to infringe our constitutionally protected right to harvest and sell fish to support a moderate livelihood. We have been waiting nearly 20 years since the decision in the Marshall case in September of 1999 for the implementation of our right to harvest for a moderate livelihood. Section 2 defines an indigenous fishery as fish harvested by an indigenous organization or any of its members for the purpose of using this fish as food for social or ceremonial purposes or for purposes set out in, in a land claims agreement entered into with the indigenous organization. This definition of indigenous fishery does not recognize and protect all fisheries unique to indigenous people. That severely undermines the reconciliatory purpose of Bill C-68. While Aboriginals will be able to participate in commercial and recreational fisheries, along with everyone else under the same licenses rules and, rec and regulations, this definition, identical to the Aboriginal fishery definition introduced in 2012, continues to deny us the opportunity to have any other fishery based on our constitutionally protected Aboriginal or treaty rights. For Mi'kmaq specifically, this means that we will continue to be prohibited by the Fisheries Act from engaging in our Supreme, Supreme Court affirmed right to fish for a moderate livelihood. A moderate livelihood fishery is neither a subsistence fishery nor a commercial fishery. 
the Mi'kmaq right to fish for a moderate livelihood is based on a series of tre treaties made in 1760 and 61 and was affirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada in its 1999 Donald Marshall decision. Our right to fish for a moderate livelihood is a constitutionally protected treaty right recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitutional Act. Bill C-68 not only disregards this, but it also leaves both of our people and the Crown with serious compromises. The 2012 amendments to the Fisheries Act introduced the definition of Aboriginal fishery. By indefinitely continuing this definition, Canada continues to deny our right to fish for a moderate livelihood. In advance of our appearance before the Standing <coughs> Senate Committee on Energy, the Environment, and Natural Resources in 2012, we were told by the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans that despite our constitutional rights, any unlicensed fishery would be regarded as illegal and subject to prosecution. This has proved to be true. The continued denial of our right to take part in a moderate livelihood fishery has had major implications for our people. Many in our communities still trade or sell what they collect through hunting, fishing, and gathering to provide for their own families. This fishery is not about wealth. It has never been. It has always been about survival. The continued failure to recognize our moderate livelihood fishery makes the proposed amendments to the Fisheries Act both under-inclusive and unconstitutional. Before I turn the microphone over to my colleague, Bruce Walsmith, to further discuss concerns we have with Bill C-68. I hope you can recognize how strongly rooted our concerns are in the traditions, lives, and culture of our people. The failure to recognize and protect our rights-based fishery in Bill C-68 will affect the lives of our people and the foundation we have attempted to build nation to nation. May we suggest that if indigenous fishery must be defined in the act, then it be defined as indigenous in relation to a fishery means fish harvested by an indigenous organization or any of its members pursuant to the recognition and affirmation of Aboriginal and treaty rights in section 35 of the Constitutional Act 1982 or for any purposes set out in any rights implementation measure as agreed to by the Crown and Indigenous peoples. We ask that you make the recommendation for the definition of indig Indigenous to be amended, ensuring that the constitutional rights of the Mi'kmaq are not overlooked and dismissed any longer. My co-presenter, Mr. Bruce Walsman, legal counsel for the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, will now address other matters of concern with Bill C-68. Well, Alio, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief Paul. Mr. Walsman. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and senators and uh, guests. Uh, I want to pick up on the second aspect of the definition of indigenous in relation to fisheries. Um, Chief Paul has gone over the fact that the way that the uh, meaning is, uh, the definition is structured, uh, it involves two kinds of approaches. One approach is to define the purpose for which the fishing activity takes place, uh, and uh, it's defined now to include what uh, DFO loosely calls FSC fisheries, meaning food, social, and ceremonial. 
but what it does not include is the purpose that Chief Paul is speaking about, the one that derives from the Donald Marshall Supreme Court decision in 1999 and the series of treaties made in the Maritimes uh, with uh, the indigenous people who were in all of the province of uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and the Gaspe area of Quebec, treaties made in 1760 and 61, and that is for the purpose of earning a moderate livelihood. So if you approach the definition from the standpoint of the purpose of the fishery, what we're saying is it's under-inclusive because there is a constitutional right protected by Section 35 and Supreme Court of Canada decision for the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet people, the Passamaquoddy people, and the uh, uh, Mi'kmaq who are uh, in Prince Edward Island, the Gas Bay, all of whom are beneficiaries of the same set of treaties to fish for a moderate livelihood. So from a definitional standpoint, the purpose is under-inclusive. But the other thing that is in the definition are land claim agreements. And what we wanted to draw to your attention is that through the Department now of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada, a new approach is being uh, rolled out across the country uh, for uh, a replacement process for the comprehensive claims uh, uh, documents that resulted in these agreements. So yes, there are uh, land claim agreements, but we are now engaged across the country in something which in the Maritimes is called a rights reconciliation process, leading to, hopefully, in the, in the case of fisheries, rights reconciliation agreements. On a national basis, the terminology is different from the uh, Federal Department of uh, Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, uh, and they now refer to this process as a recognition of Indigenous rights and self-determination. Uh, I'm not sure if Chantel uh, had the opportunity to pass out to you. I guess she did. Uh, this comes from the website of uh, that department exploring new ways of working together. And I wanted to point out a couple of things. There's 27 pages in the original, but I only burdened you with, uh, I think, four pages, leading up to the listing uh, on their site of the different places and processes across the country where this is uh, being undertaken. But I, what I wanted to, uh, uh, to indicate is, uh, as they say on the very uh, page number two, but the, the second page that you have here, uh, it says that there are 75 tables across the country that are talking about this, involving uh, representing uh, 380 indigenous communities and a total population of more than 700,000 people. I understand the figures are actually higher now, but this is what's on the, on the, latest, uh, uh, the latest website. And if you look through uh, these couple of pages, uh, the one word that leaps out to me, and I hope leaps, leaps out to you, is the word agreements. So what, what this is a process is, instead of a land claim agreement, it's a rights, uh, or a recognition of Indigenous rights and self-determination agreement. And this would encompass, uh, obviously, a broad range of subjects, but I can tell you, uh, because I'm involved in it, that this process is undergoing in Nova Scotia, it's undergoing in Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and the Gas Bay, and it's undergoing in relation to fisheries. So if we're going to have a definition uh, in the statute that singles out agreements, surely what should be included in here are agreements that are reached with indigenous uh, governments across the country under the the substitute process called recognition of indigenous rights and self-determination. Now you'll see in our written submission that we provided you, we refer to them as rights reconciliation arrangements or agreements, RRAs, and that is the name that they're being given in the maritime provinces, and I believe Gas Bay as well, because this process that's been rolled out nationally started in Nova Scotia. It's a 
made in Nova Scotia process that uh, through the wisdom of officials in the former Department of uh, Indian, uh, Indian Affairs uh, saw the wisdom of and because these negotiations were stalling across the country, uh, they said we need a new process. Maybe this is a process that will result in agreements where comprehensive agreements are not working very well. We can have sectoral agreements and fisheries uh, as Chief Paul has pointed out, is one of the things that are near and dear uh, to the hearts of the Aboriginal peoples in the Maritimes. Uh, and this is a process that is ongoing daily. In fact, Chief Paul was meeting today with the Chief Federal Fisheries Negotiator uh, to talk about that process. So uh, work is continuing. It's under uh, without prejudice protection, so only the generality can be provided, but uh, the generality is that it's a live process, it's undergoing, uh, cabinet has approved it, uh, so it's, it's, it's there. So why would the definition uh, that is in the amended Fisheries Act, um, which on the face of it would purport to encompass all of the fisheries that are unique to Indigenous people, why would it not include the fruit of this new process as well? So I think that <coughs> concludes. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. <coughs> and as usual, we will go to our first questions from our Deputy Chair, Senator Gold. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much for coming and accommodating our, our schedule. Um, um, and, and thank you for the uh, for the specificity of your of your of your recommendations as well. So my my related questions around around the issues that you raised first, with regard to uh, the definition of indigenous fisheries in uh, C sixty eight, um, have you raised this issue in the context of your discussions with government? Uh, that these discussions dealing with the rights recognition agreements, the process that you've just described. Uh, have you raised your concerns with government ab about this particular act? And if so, what kind of response uh, have you got? Well, I, th I think I could answer it this way. Uh, there is a negotiating process with chief federal negotiators, uh, a chief federal fisheries negotiator, and in the course of that process, one of the uh, elements of discussion is uh, how do you give effect to these agreements? So saying that um, how do they relate to existing statutes or amending statutes uh, has been something that is brought up in the course of that. Um, and all I can say is, well, that's where it went and where it went from there, uh, they would have to respond to or people in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans would have to respond to. Oh, okay, so I take it, uh, I shouldn't press the point for it. And I'm just trying to under, I mean, I'm. And we'll have opportunities, I'm sure, to hear hear from them again. But I'm just interested to know if you would ab were able to share with us what kind of reception you got to the notion of an expan of a more expansive, or more comprehensive definition of indigenous fishery in the act. Well, I think one thing we could say with uh, a certain certitude uh, is that when these amendments were made, I think, as Chief Paul said in, in uh, 2012, uh, it still was after the Marshall decision. Uh, we appeared in front of the Senate committee at the time and made the point that uh, the Donald Marshall case and constitutional rights and the right to fish for a moderate livelihood was something that should be included. But it wasn't. <laughs> um, if I may, Chair, just... Uh, um, um, you've also um, uh, commented on both the apparent inconsistency in the Act between... Section 2.3, the uh, so-called non-derogation clause, and then the uh, um, taking into account impact clause of 2.4. Um, <clears throat> I think we'd all understand that non-derogation clauses, whatever their language, is no substitute for clarity and precision and, and, and proper scope of, in legislative language, but they do serve a function and they do appear in, in, in legislation. So my question is this. Um, the language in Section 2.3 is, is 
not the most recent, but is a more recent version of a non-derogation clause than the one that first appeared post-patriation. Uh, some think it's more protective or less protective, but my question isn't the fine, the fine terms of, of der non-derogation -der clause. I guess my question is simply this. In your experience, when government falls short or, or, or fails to respect um, uh, uh, indigenous rights, um, has it been because of the wording, the particular wording of a non-derogation clause, or is it more because they, the practices, policies, will uh, hasn't been there to respect the rights that that uh, that are that are recognized and affirmed uh, in the Constitution? So I guess my qu my question is, uh, I mean, the lawyer in me says, of course, the language is really important, but the question is how how important is the the, the version of the non-derogation clause? That appears in this act, as compared to what is really at stake, which is how the government uh, re relates nation to nation with with you and others in the ter in terms of giving real life to 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 your rights. There's a question in there somewhere. I think <laughs> I think I did uh, glimpse that question. <laughs> uh, what I would say is this. Uh, I haven't seen a situation, in my experience, where uh, anything turned on the precision around that wording. Uh, I recall two particular things. I recall um, a situation in which, um, two situations actually, in which Crown lawyers were not respecting those clauses uh, initially. Uh, but when it was called to their attention, they sort of withdrew what they were purporting to do that was inconsistent with it. So they, they served a real value in that case. And I do recall another lay witness from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans on the witness stand uh, who said, uh, well, I thought they all meant the same thing. In other words, it is without prejudice and uh, non-derogation. And uh, they thought it was all the same, and we're not hung up on the wording. Thank but you. I think uh, just to come back, I'm sorry, <laughs> to, to, to capture the point that we were trying to make in the brief is why, why is there inconsistent wording? Why, what is the intention to have wording in the two clauses that are back to back that don't seem to be the same? And uh, uh, as you would know, the one of the fundamental principles of interpretation, whether it's a document or a statute like this, is, well, if you use different wording to try to express the same thing, there must be a reason why there is different wording. And it's one of the things that lawyers get caught up on and say, well, what is the reason? And uh, you can see in our brief that we didn't purport to say there is a reason, but the, the uh, authors and the promoters of the bill presumably will tell you what they think is the difference and they haven't told us. So you've answered the like the follow-up question I don't have to ask. So you don't know what their ex explanation is. Thank you, Chair. Senator Gold is a lawyer, too, so maybe he'll find out for us. Oh, sure. We can share it with you. <laughs> Senator Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for coming today. <clears throat> um, so the Marshall decision, 1999, what went on between 1999 and uh, 2012 before they came up with this term, Aboriginal fishery? What went on? Mm -hmm. well, uh, well, the government. Well, they, went, they went, you know, uh, 13 years from a decision that seems pretty, you know, pretty clear and and all of a sudden, in 2012, the government decides we'll put in the term Aboriginal fishery. What what happened? What was going on? Were, were you allowed to fish? Were you allowed to make a reasonable uh, living from it? Or was it has it been illegal? Well, one of our problems is that we're uh, very patient people. <laughs> okay, so we the, the government, uh, through uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, came up with uh, interim measures. And that's okay. what we've been fishing under since we still fish under the uh, DFO regulations like anyone else. And it hasn't, they, they come up with this interim measure 
because they had nothing in place to deal with the uh, court decision. The court decision <coughs> wasn't expected on what, it, what, what was decided. Nobody in government believed that we could win this case. Well, this, this is what I'm getting to. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't understand some of the intricacies of this. But it would seem to me that there's a Supreme Court decision uh, that affirms that fishing for a moderate livelihood uh, is based not only on 1760, 1761, but also Section 35 of the Constitution Act. Am I correct in that? So, effectively, DFO and, by extension, us, have been acting unconstitutionally against Indigenous peoples. Is, is that what I'm hearing? I would say yes. Uh, yes, and maybe to, to add some elaboration, shortly after that there was uh, actual violence on the water yes. when people attempted to exercise that right, and, uh, and uh, they were stopped by DFO enforcement officers. Uh, big incident in Burke Church, uh, incident in St. Mary's Bay in Nova Scotia. Um, people were prosecuted. Were so they convicted? Uh, what happened, uh, as Chief Paul was saying, uh, part of the DFO response to it was, we can have an interim measure. Uh, the interim was, we will make practical access to the water for commercial fishing. Um, and we will negotiate at a time in the future the actual application of the rights. That was the DFO response. Uh, and they uh, are still in that process, you might say. Uh, it took until 2007 to have a framework agreement to structure this with Canada as a whole, not just DFO, uh, with Canada as a whole. And it, it took a... Mm, six, seven years after that, something like 2012, 2013, before DFO actually came to the table and said, we now have a mandate. And that mandate changed as of the appointment by then Federal Fisheries Minister uh, Dominique LeBlanc uh, last November when he met with the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq chiefs and other chiefs in the Maritimes and said, Cabinet has now approved me, uh, sorry, uh, approved a man named Jim Jones, a retired uh, DFO regional director general from the Gulf region, to be the chief federal negotiator and to negotiate with you. And that happened uh, last November. And as I said, that process is now ongoing. So what happened is, uh, for time and time again, it said, where is the moderate livelihood fishery? Time and time again. On the 10th anniversary of Marshall in 2009, uh, there was a major event, a, a press conference, uh, speakers uh, calling on Canada to say, where is the moderate livelihood fishery? It's been 10 years now. It's been a decade. It's been 20 since the decision. Yes, now it is 20 years. It's way beyond patience, Chief. Way beyond patience. But you see, the Chief explained, if someone goes out and exercises that right, DFO says you have no license to do that. Therefore, it is illegal. You've contravened the Fisheries Act. I, I, don't, I don't want to prolong this, but <clears throat> DFO can't tell you you don't have a license to do that because the Supreme Court says you don't need a license to do that. And I, I just don't understand how, you, how, how we as a government uh, can blatantly disregard a Supreme Court decision. I mean... It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not apologizing. We're not but, the government. Well, we're a part of it. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Oh, I, I might just put note then that uh, there were prosecutions in uh, within the last year, and uh, eventually the people who are being prosecuted um, the Department of Fisheries official apparently gave evidence to say, well, we don't have any regulations for this fishery. And thereafter, the Department of Justice entered a stay in the prosecution. Now, those fishermen whose catch was seized, etc., have started a civil action 
saying that they were wrongfully you know, prosecuted and uh, damages as a result. Thank you. Take it, Chair. Yeah. Well, there's something new every day, but there's a new, a new definition for interim, that's for sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Campbell. We'll go to Senator McGinnis and then Senator Poyer. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you, Chief Paul. And Mr. Wildsmith, you're aging well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's good, to, it's, good, to, it's good to see you. You look exactly the same <laughs> as 20 years ago. Uh, and, and no, I'm unable to say the same for, my, for myself. <laughs> But it's good. It's good to see you. You you certainly have a reputation that uh, precedes you. In my mind, you you've um, you've done uh, no noble service for uh, the native communities in our area. Uh, look, I um, probably is the reason that uh, the government have not included what's being negotiated now in the act is because your negotiations are not completed. Is that correct? Uh, They're I ongoing. I can't speak for them about that, but you know, part of the problem I would see is once you have an agreement through this new process, it's not mirrored in the Fisheries Act in any way. So you think it should we we should be out front? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so how do you see this reconciliation ar arrangement? Will that ultimately be enshrined in legislation? You ask a very, very uh, good question, Senator. That's something that we ask all the time. And the answer that is being given is possibly if there's legislative amendments required, uh, there might be, but we're presently operating within the existing statutory framework. Uh, therefore, uh, we can't do anything that the Fisheries Act doesn't really allow us to do. But once this agreement is reached, um, will it be ongoing? Will there be additional changes down the road and so on? Will, it, will, there, will negotiations continue and always be open? What, what's, what's hoped to be achieved is a level of certainty for a period of time. And this is one of the big differences between the land claims agreements that were uh, attempted to wrap up in a comprehensive way and a stake driven through the heart of it so that that was the end of it. Whereas this new process is an ongoing process that has time limits to it. So, you know, at the moment um, for the fishery side of it, it could be anywhere from 10 to 25 years. That's the, the nature of what's being discussed at the table. But I think a minimum from uh, the standpoint of what we're being told from the fisheries and ocean standpoint is 10 years once you have the agreement. Yeah, okay. Um, you, uh, you're in the room, not you personally perhaps, but others representing First Nations with respect to these negotiations. You're there with the federal government representatives, presumably. Do these topics come up at all? Uh, were you, did they consult with you about C-68? Um, was there any discussion whatsoever? Uh, I mean, I know you're not there specifically dealing with the bill, uh, but uh, did you have knowledge? Uh, I mean, it strikes me that it, it shouldn't be a challenge for fisheries and oceans to include in a moderate livelihood uh, in the definition. I mean, that makes eminently good sense. I mean, the late Donald Marshall Jr., uh, you know, and versus the, the Crown versus uh, Donald Marshall Jr. Um, decision is a common law now, uh, and one would expect that uh, they would have a challenge, as Senator Campbell mentioned, in, um, in convicting anyone operating or fishing under the guise that's the way uh, the late Donald Marshall Jr. did. Uh, so how, how is it that Fisher's notion didn't recognize that? 
I mean, you can you can bring in statutory law to change certain common law. Uh, we've seen that happen, but but here the common law was there. So what right did Fisheries and Oceans uh, have uh, to uh, to to change that and to prevent you from operating uh, different than than what Tom McGinnis would it would do? I mean, you have to go get a license, and if you don't then you're going to be charged. That's not the common law in this country, and it wasn't. So how did that happen? I, I'm sorry, I, I really, you know, I think that it's a great question. Uh, I have no answer except that when it's been brought up, uh, there has not been a, a positive response. Now, the negotiations that we're talking about, the RRA, could lead to the recognition of that right and its incorporation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one hopes to know enough to, with certainty as to what exactly can be done uh, on the water by the Mi'kmaq without fearing uh, prosecution. That's the kind of level of, of detail that we hope will be achieved in those negotiations, but at the moment, uh, the standard response is, well, it's not yet authorized. Yeah, well, I mean, I I appreciate, uh, you know, your, as was mentioned earlier, your patience <coughs> and reasonableness, but uh, Mr. Wildsmith, I also know your legal reputation, and uh, it's a good one, uh, and uh, this could have been challenged. This is... It's not. I think you, you, no one likes to uh, to continue to appear before the Supreme Court in matters when when it's already been handled by Donald Marshall Jr. Uh, but I I just fail to see why uh, this wasn't pursued. Just uh, you know, it's a matter of principle. Anyway. It's, it's, it, I shouldn't say this, but it's probably typical the way you've been handled in the past, and it's not fair. Thank you, Senator McGinnis. Uh, Senator Poye, followed by Senator Christmas. Uh, thank you both for being here. Um, I actually just have one question. Um, at the beginning of April, um, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, when he appeared before the committee, said that there was an intention in Bill C-68 to ensure that there is a strong Indigenous participation. And since then, the committee, uh, we've heard testimony and received briefs uh, from Indigenous groups that both some agree and some disagree with that statement. Um, so in your view, uh, could you share with us, uh, would the Fisheries Act, as amended by Bill C-68, ensure, in your opinion, strong Indigenous participation? Well, not with the way it's presently worded. We still don't have uh, implementation of the right. What we have implemented so far is an interim process. And the government's interim processes are not too interim, <laughs> really. I mean, and, and it is, I, I believe, it's, it's, it's the government's interpretation of a court ruling to probably its narrowest meaning. I'll give you an example of that. The first mandate that uh, the Fisheries and Oceans received from the government, I'm not sure, it was, it was about 10 years later from the uh, decision. We finally got a mandate. I'm in the room and I'm hearing this. And the person representing DFO is saying, we have a not, uh, finally got a mandate to implement your rights. But by the way, no new access. So they're going to implement our rights without being able to get access to the fish. And we're supposed to swallow that. It's, it, it's so blatant, like it's, you know, and at that time. But the same group, the same person I was talking to, representing DFO, 
got another uh, mandate when the government changed, just added that now we're going to be talking about access. So the so, minister's intention, uh, when he says his intention was the Bill C-68 would ensure that there was a strong Indigenous participation, if I'm understanding right, Bill C-68 does nothing for you guys. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't address the, problem. the Supreme Court decision Decisions. Yeah. Okay. that Thank we you. have a yeah. treaty right yeah. to fish for a livelihood fishing. That's not what's being discussed at the highest levels. And it's like, I, I am sorry, but this is how I feel because of the experience I've had <laughs> over the years, being 35 years in, as chief, it is a bureaucracy that's in existence that's had a certain way of thinking, and we're not part of that thinking. And it's brand new to the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy was not ready for this decision. And the reason why I said that, because I was told by those very uh, bureaucrats. You know, they and haven't been ready in 20 years. I don't know how long it's going to take them to be ready again. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think it's just like, it's, it's sort of like a we versus they thing. Like as if we're going to harm or damage the economy of the country. Where, I, from my experience of what I've done, we help improve the economy. There are studies that prove that. I'm a member of the National Aboriginal Economic Development Board. We have done some benchmarks in a number of areas. And what those studies say is that at the end of it all, the indigenous people in this country contribute in a positive manner rather than negative. So we're not costing the government any anything, really. We give back more than what we get from the government. So I feel that what it is, really, is it's the mindset is not there. Like, there, for some reason, indigenous people All they're afforded is maybe a box to check off that you've consulted with the indigenous people. We didn't get agreement. They didn't like what happened. They don't agree with doing this. But you can still check the box off because you've consulted with us. But it's supposed to be in a meaningful manner, in a meaningful way. Thank you. If I, if I could add something else to what Chief Paul said, <clears throat> when he said uh, we have these interim agreements or measures, uh, but now we have a mandate for access. All of the fisheries that are of interest to uh, support a moderate livelihood are what are in DFO language referred to as limited entry fisheries. And that means is that you can't have new entrance in there without removing existing entrance because the fishery is fully subscribed. And, you know, if, if lobster is, is an example, which is one that the Big Ma, you know, would like to use as a basis for moderate livelihood, uh, all of the lobster fishing licenses and opportunities are allocated now. Some are to First Nations for commercial purposes, but the point is it's fully subscribed there are no new entrants allowed. So as soon as uh, a Mi'kmaq fisher without a license goes to fish, the answer is, well, conservation is at risk. We can't have an unlicensed new entrant in there. We have to do something that allows this new entrant to get in. And, and the only way that they will allow the new entrants is to buy out the existing entrants. So if you have a lobster license that's $800,000, well, to get one license, somebody has to cough up $800,000 in order to make room for a new entrant. So, I mean, that's part of the problem of all of this is how do you get access to ground fish? How do you get access to snow crab and 
and shrimp and scallops and lobster. You have to buy out people that are already there because it's not you know, politically saleable to take somebody out without uh, their agreement. Thank you. It was a very interesting discussion. And I say to Chief Paul in, in my time here that the Indigenous people around our table here are uh, some meaningful and instructive uh, contribution to our, our deliberations here. And we're very pleased to have the people such as the people who sit around this table. Um, Senator Poye, thank you. Senator Christmas. Uh, there we uh, go. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> Uh, Chief Paul, um, uh, you represent uh, the fisheries portfolio for all 13 chiefs in Nova Scotia. Um, one of the, uh, what I'd like for you to sort of uh, describe for the record is what moderate fishery, moderate livelihood fishery means. So in your remarks, you, you make these remarks that many in our community still trade or sell what they collect through hunting, fishing, and gathering to provide for their own families. This fishery is not about wealth. It has never been. It's always been about survival. So I think most people understand what food fishery is, and most people understand what commercial fishery is. Can you explain for the record what moderate livelihood fishery is? Well, to me, it, it, it's the ability of... Uh, 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 our people to be able to provide for their families in a modern way. And that is to make enough out of the fishery to be able to pay your bills, have shelter, be able to provide for your kids and, you know, with clothing like anybody else, you know, maybe, maybe you have a vehicle in the yard, maybe two, you know, I'm not making promises. You know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like the way the rest of the world lives in a, in a modern way, but not, not, not in the, uh, the 1% class of people that are uh, above, you know, the, the middle class. So it, it would be like a middle class income, really, where the people that are involved, the Mi'kmaqs that are involved in the fishery are able to look after their families. Nedugalik, Atugalik, you're going out to provide for your family. And that's what most all our people want, to be able to do that. So, uh, Chief Paul, uh, you've, I know the Assembly has done a lot of work on this. That you, you've made efforts to take studies, to have researchers go out and try to quantify what moderate livelihood fishery means. So could you explain how the assembly have come to that point of understanding what this definition means and what it means specifically to our communities and, and to our families? Well, I can give you an example of uh, perhaps like in the food fishery. Uh, we are certainly not uh, where we should be just on the food fishery. And that's just to provide ourselves with, with the food, the fish. You know, there was a study, as you mentioned, there was a study done several years ago on, on our food fishery. And one glaring fact that came out of that is that in Nova Scotia, collectively, we are not getting a total of 800,000 pounds of fish annually for food that we are not getting, we're not able to get because of the waters that we have to go in, the safety of the water, I mean, being there. If we put out our traps there, they'll be cut the same night. We have, that's, that has happened. It's on record. We went to the DFO. They really couldn't do anything or wouldn't do anything. We asked why. We, we're, we should be afforded the same protection. Sorry, but we live here. That's the answer. So it's a kind of sad way of finding out what your livelihood uh, can be, or you know, and that's part of it. So 
that would resolve a lot of the issues if we were able to do that as far as our food fishery is concerned. Even at that level, though, we're, we're, most times we're not able to go out there. Not that, that we don't want to. It's what will happen to our gear, what will happen to us. Um, Chief Terry, one last question, and uh, I know this is uh, a bit of a personal one, but I think it's important. Um, you were a good friend of Dal Marshall, Jr., um, and unfortunately he didn't live to see this fishery implemented. If you had the chance to speak to Jr. and ask him what he was trying to do by establishing this moderate livelihood fishery, what do you think he would have said? I don't know. He would have said uh, a number of things. Like I, uh, he, he practically was a brother to me, and uh, he had a very, very difficult time in uh, going through this process. And uh, certainly was in touch with him when all this was going on, when his nets were being seized or his his eels were being seized, his boat was being. And. I remember talking to him daily on that and calling me. And of course, any time there was a question of what he'd do next, I most certainly got legal advice on that. And he was was mostly, if not all of it, from Bruce Walsman here. And the statement that I remember mostly <coughs> about what he was advised on, and this is probably what he would say, to answer your question on what Junior would say, and is keep fishing. Keep fishing. Because we have a right to do that. And he was, because of what happened to him before, and I'm not sure if uh, the, the uh, committee is aware or the group that uh, he spent 11 years in prison for a crime that he, he didn't commit. That's a stark example of what society does to people that are not accepted. And that was, that's what was in his mind the most, that not having to go back to that. But I talked to him about like how important it was and what he was doing, and he himself believed in that, believed that we had a right to fish. It was ingrained in him. His father was the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq for over 30 years, and it was instilled in him that he do the right thing. And on that basis, and I knew myself that he already had a name. And then when the government seen his name and the charges, they will pay attention. And we talked about that. And this is why he continued, because he, he continued to do it for all the people, for the Mi'kmaq, not for himself. He didn't gain too much out of, of, of this fishery and, uh, and of this decision. And in fact, like uh, I think it did a great toll on him, where uh, later on, after the decision, he had to go through a double lung operation. We gave him another eight years. But it did take a big toll on him and his family. And a lot of the Mi'kmaqs were affected by that. So my answer is keep fishing. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Christmas. Uh, Senator Wells. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for appearing before us today. I'm going to switch tracks a little bit um, and go to Clause 21 and and uh, and 40 of the bill. Clause 21 of Bill C-68 requires the minister or the prescribed authority to consider Indigenous knowledge that's been provided prior to issuing authorizations and permits. So in, in our legislative process, we look at words like require, we look at words like may and shall, shall being a directive. 
and in this case, this requires the minister um, to uh, to consider Indigenous knowledge. Clause 40 ensures that the Indigenous knowledge provided shall remain confidential and stipulates the specific circumstances in which the minister may disclose this. Um, given that our uh, license granting process is is is, is supposed to be based on science, uh, and now with the inclusion of, indi of indigenous knowledge, which, which I would also grant as scientific as well, because it's based on uh, historical knowledge. Um, what do you think of this lack of transparency, this option that the minister has, or the requirement that the minister has to not be transparent when he's seeking this indigenous knowledge when considering licensing? So the, it, in, the, in, the, in the bill, it stipulates Clause 40 ensures that the Indigenous knowledge provided to the Minister shall remain confidential and stipulates the specific circumstances in which the Minister may disclose the information after consulting with those who gave the knowledge and those uh, and identifying who, 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 to whom the knowledge is to be disclosed. So that's a, it show, for me, I'll, I'll preface the question a little bit, but to me it shows a lack of transparency in the process of making a decision and 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 I'll say using the using the, the using the indigenous knowledge which is valid we all recognize it's valid or certainly I recognize it's valid in that decision making um, I know former minister LeBlanc for instance in his decision on surf clams ran into some trouble because there was no transparency um, and the, and the decision was rescinded. So what do you think of this transparency requirement uh, or sort of lack of transparency requirement where the minister doesn't have to disclose this, uh, the indigenous knowledge which, goes, which will go towards making his decision? Well, I guess in general, uh, I would say that uh, indigenous knowledge is proprietary. It's like any other uh, technical knowledge in the fishery. I'll give you an example of that. I mean, the companies like Clearwater, they have proprietary information on how to prosecute that Arctic surf clam. Uh, that is understood that why, why would their proprietary knowledge be transparent when it protects their knowledge how to prosecute that fishery economically and efficiently? And sustainability. Well, with respect to, to the the knowledge that uh, that Clearwater has, that that's that's granted back to the to the government for them to make decisions on on uh, harvesting areas and quotas and that sort of thing. All that's delivered back to the to the government, and that's actually not. While it might be, it's actually not proprietary. It's reportable and it's published information. Or the catch is, yeah, not not how they fished it. Well, that, that surf clam dragging is well known as well. Well, they got proprietary uh, technology on that. It's, uh, no one else does it. So no one else knows how to do it. So you think? So it's your belief that the uh, you're in agreement that this uh, the knowledge that's that the <laughs> so strange. So the the indigenous knowledge that's been provided. Prior to issuing the issuing the authorization, you think that should remain confidential and not be transparent to the to this common property resource. If it's proprietary to the uh, to the Mi'kmaq, their knowledge. Can you give me an example of what might be proprietary in in indigenous knowledge that would go towards providing an authorization for a license? I'm not. I'm not getting it at all. Um, well, an example of it, in like, in, in like, I mean, like, some someone mentioned that uh, it was uh, decisions by the government, DFO in particular, are based on science, even though we're oversubscribed. So I'm not sure how much the DFO is listening to the science, okay, and you read it every day in the papers. You know, and uh, our elders, like, by experience, have tremendous knowledge about how the fish behave, when they spawn, where they spawn, 
and they take that into account uh, whether or not we fish that fish, when it's the best time to do that, not when they're spawning. So this knowledge is utilized by us, by the Mi'kmaq, to be able to sustainably fish for food for the for the fish that we want. Okay, thank you. I won't uh, argue the point, but thanks for your input on that. Thank you, uh, Senator Wells, and thank you to our witnesses. Just to get back, if I could, and to uh, your document that you shared with us earlier. Um, you mentioned Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and the Gas Bay. Um, I'm just wondering, just for a clarification, uh, the discussion tables in the region, it says Atlantic. Is that where Newfoundland and Labrador will be involved, uh, and how uh, they stand alone on, on that? Uh, I, I know, uh, Senator, that uh, this next 26 pages or so that we didn't provide you has a list of all of those okay. communities, and I'd have to look through it to actually no. see about Labrador. As you know, uh, Canada takes the position that the Marshall decision and those treaties uh, do not apply to the island of Newfoundland or to Labrador. However, I know there is uh, an agreement that's been reached in Labrador with the Inuit, I believe, uh, and I would be very surprised if there wasn't ongoing discussions with the Inu. Uh, I see the Métis are part of this. Oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll find. I just, uh, you know, I've been here 12 years, and there's a, there's a lot of the bureaucracy things that kind of ends at Halifax, so I was just making sure that they didn't. <laughs> so I so just want to make sure. That's fine, uh, Mr. Wurz. I'll, I'll find it. Anyway, uh, thank you, folks, and uh, thank you to our witnesses, uh, certainly for a very uh, interesting uh, conversation and uh, certainly a great contribution to our uh, study on VLC 68. I certainly want to thank you again for taking the time to join us here. And as I have said to uh, previous witnesses, uh, if there's something that you think about after you leave here tonight that you wish you had said or had told us about, uh, feel free over the next uh, week or so to uh, send it on to our clerk. And uh, as we uh, move towards uh, home plate, uh, we're dealing with uh, Bill C-68. So uh, uh, once again, I thank on behalf of our committee members, thank uh, you and all our witnesses this evening. It's, uh, it's been a... Uh, a very interesting uh, evening. Much information for us to uh, contemplate over the next few weeks. So thank you for your time. We'll see you Thursday morning, folks.